We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors. We're on episode 152 now. Um, I know. And this episode is all about inner child work that you're an expert on, Mr. Cook. (laughs) I've got an expert on it, but (laughs) I have worked in the area of helping people deal with uh, inner turmoils. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because the term inner child um, has been around for such a long time, um, often seen as a buzzword. But if we define what we mean by that, it's working with people's unmet needs from the past, people's traumas, people's conflicts, people's unhappiness, which has their origins from their younger self yeah hence term inner child in other words when we talk about inner we mean um that the difficulties the conflicts the needs come from our internal world that's what i mean by inner yeah so that's why people call it the inner child or the internal younger self which has um, not being able to achieve the healthy processes today. Yeah, it's really powerful stuff as well, Bob. When when you you see it in action. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you see, I think if you're going to work with someone's internal world, which has been so traumatized in their younger self, and today. The result is usually quite a lot of uh, damage or difficulties around attachment or difficulties in relationships or feeling unhappy, lonely or detached from life. But it comes from the past, the internal world, which we carry around with ourselves. Yeah. The only way that therapists can help in that type of work, which we'll call inner child work, for this sort of... um, podcast is it's a word i use a lot uh is to use with regressive techniques and regressive means simply going back to the past regress means going back so it isn't like cbt where you stay in the present yeah it isn't like and i don't want to dismiss mindfulness or cbt or any of these things here uh, but but it's like going back to the origins of the disturbance, to the origins of the dysfunctional child or the younger self. So we have to go back to where the early trauma conflict decisions were made to help the person see how the past affects the present and how we are carrying out repetitively dramatically and tragically often the very thing often the very decisions that may have helped us survive back then but certainly doesn't help today yeah so we're always going back and working with the regression because we have to get back to the younger part or the internal part of the disturbed part of ourselves now why is that so difficult one You need to think that way and be trained that way. But the biggest thing is, of course, is that clients will defend very solidly against going back to where the internal trauma was because it's their dark, dark parts of themselves which they protected so steadfastly over the years. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's real in-depth psychological psychotherapy stuff when you, you're doing inner child work at that level. 
Mm. I often it's talk to clients. Self. Say again, sorry. It's all about our internal self and yeah. our young internal self. Yeah. I often talk to clients about, you know, the, the younger self. I, I'm not sure that I do the regression work to the level that you're talking about. But I, I do talk a lot about, you know, picturing your younger self and, and you know, when I'm talking about self-care and self-love and things like that, that's what I've got an image of in my mind. You know, often it's the critical parent that's beating the inner child up and that dialogue that's going on. And I'll say to them, you know, would you say that to, to a child of five or six, you know, the way that you're talking to yourself now? Yeah, so I think as I think what you're talking about is very powerful, and it's a different dimension of the word regressiveness. So, in other words, it's still in a child work because you could say, "Okay, let's go back to that little girl in you that felt so hurt." Yeah, and it sounds like you're really hard on yourself today. How about you write a letter? to that part of yourself yeah that was so damaged all those years ago what would you say yeah now that's the purpose still staying in the here and now that's the sort of stuff that i i do do yeah so that's what i mean it's working with the developmental ideas of the past affects the present absolutely yeah and very powerful yeah very powerful i think of lots and lots of books to talk about inner child techniques where exactly what you're talking about for example you're asking your client to go home and look at when you look at yourself in the mirror and just think of yourself as the nine-year-old that's so unhappy yeah. and what would you say and then we'll bring that back and we'll talk about it yeah or go home and write down the things that you can care about yourself and we'll, well these are all the te- i can think of many and many of them yeah yeah and that's... I've even said to them to get a photograph of their younger self, do you know what I mean? So that they they can visualise that that young child and what it was that they needed. And I know you touched on it before about the relational needs and things like that. You know, it, it, I, I had a client quite recently who he was adopted and I think it was probably the third or fourth session before I even knew that he'd been adopted. But he didn't think that that had any bearing on him whatsoever. And you know why, don't you? The protection mechanism, I would have thought. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, his parents, I don't want to say overcompensated for him being adopted, but he was very nurtured. He was very loved. He was made to feel very special. And he couldn't see how that happening to him at the beginning of his life would have an effect on him because, you know, his, his adoptive parents were brilliant well when people have been adopted and i know you worked in this area so i'm sort of you know i don't want to steal any thunder here but people have been adopted what they spend their very young lives doing in orphanages yeah is concentrating on the other yeah as they don't concentrate on themselves because they want to be picked yeah they want to be best they want to please the people that are coming round so they're taken away from the orphanages, yeah. orphanages and given another life. So survival for them isn't thinking about themselves at all. Yeah. It's about pleasing the other yeah. and getting by each day. It's not about ever thinking about self-definition of themselves. So it wouldn't occur to your client that you're talking about to even think about the fact they had needs or wants because Absolutely. their yeah. own needs and wants aren't defined by themselves. It's defined by the other people. Yeah. And it's also when, you know, they are in that situation. And I'm sure, as, you know, some of the foster children that we had coming through our doors was you know, they they reacted in different ways. One was either to push you away as much as they can and be as disruptive as they can to test you out. And the other was that they would be so adaptive to not rock the boat because they didn't want you to pass them on to somebody else. You know, so they are quite unique in the, the, you know, mechanics that they use, but it all comes from that, that hurt for that inner child. But what you 
the two sides you described there are both sides of adaption. Absolutely, the rebellious the and the rebellious adaptive. Place. Yeah, one from a compliant place. Yeah, and it is a survival mechanism. Yeah, people who have severe detachment issues. You're talking about attachment issues here. Yeah, rarely think about their own needs. Yeah, and I think in the therapy room, I see that with clients. The you know the the rebellious and the adaptive. It's yeah. It fascinates me, Bob. I know I say that in probably every podcast episode that we do, but psychotherapy and the the defense mechanisms and the protective things that we do, it it really does fascinate me. Yeah, and I think I think that many therapists, when we're working with the inner child levels we're talking about here, you can do it from the present with all the powerful techniques that you're talking about. They are, if you ask clients to, you know keep a diary about what they want every day or if you ask clients to get pictures of when they were four and five if they have them yeah they're very powerful mechanisms of working with unmet needs of looking at the early traumas yeah to ask them for the first time perhaps to concentrate on their own needs they're all very powerful techniques you talk about and that's one dimension of working with the inner child and very, very common, if you write, buy books on the inner child. Yeah. You'll get all these techniques you just talked about. Very, very powerful. There is another way to work with regression as well, though. That's what you've just said. Yeah. So if you say, you know, let's just go back in time to the part of yourself which perhaps never even thinks about your own needs and wants here. What sort of age are you? They say, I don't know, six or seven. So where are you? I'm in my bedroom. And what do you think about? Well, I'm not really thinking about anything. Well, if you were thinking about anything, what do you think I'd be thinking about? Well, I'd be thinking about when my mum and dad's footsteps are going to come along so I can then tend to be, pretend to be asleep or whatever the story is they're going to tell yeah. And then you say, okay, so just imagine now that if you could say to your mother, mother, let's pick your mother, something, what would you say? And you go along this way. And then you might say, okay, put your mother over there in that chair and talk to your mum about what you never talked about. So you're starting to actually work aggressively with them yeah in the history yeah and that again is really powerful because you know i've I've witnessed that in in training and the things that come up in that conversation with the you know the parent that's on the chair is unbelievable oh. Oh. yeah even if you ever get to the stage of them playing out the mother they never had in those sort of aggressive ways we're talking about what you're helping them doing is reconfigure and heal a younger self or repair or your reparenting yeah. work might be happening or reparative work, but it would demand you going back to do these actionistic techniques or these relational works. Uh, so that's another way of working with regression. Another yeah. way of working with the younger self dealing with the deficits and and helping them heal the split parts of themselves. Yeah. And then I suppose there's the the integrating after you've done that sort of work or whatever. And you know, I think when I first started therapy, I used to think that it was just like integrating one bit. But it, it's integrating every single part. <laughs> It's a, it's an ongoing thing. It's not just doing it once and that's it. It's, you know, integrating the child of four and five and six and the teenager and everything. Yeah, the different different developmental levels. Absolutely, yeah. Where you've given over your power. Yeah. And you've given over your ownership of yourself to the other to survive. Yeah. And coming to terms with, with that vulnerability and 
you know, not being judgmental of yourself, you know, or critical that you did that. Yeah, it's it's really powerful in a child work. I think that I the best work I see and the best impact on clients is often when we've done some of that inner child work. Yeah, and because they're so adaptive or rebelliousness, rebellious, I think the relationship work of you know trust, attachment, and all the sort of stuff in the here and now. So there's a secure base mm. and trust built up with the therapist is really the first stage. Yeah. Because otherwise the inner child work won't happen because the, the client won't feel safe enough to go back to a young and developmental age. Yeah. Or even if they do it, they'll be doing it to adapt to yourself. And the problem with that is change never happens from an adapted place. Yeah. And that's a really tricky one that to work out, I think, is is whether they are doing it from an adaptive place or whether, yeah, absolutely. How do you know? I think the best way actually to ask them. I don't mean, are you coming from the adaptive place? Yeah, <laughs> not sorry, quite so blunt. Like that. But I think things like, you know, as we're talking here and we're talking about you going back to a younger part of yourself, what, what age are you at the moment as you're talking to me? And where are you? And what's happening for you? Yeah. What's happening in your body? And what are you thinking about? And just go back and lower your voice as you go back developmentally to the age they are. And if they say, well, I don't know where I am, or don't know where I'm going, or don't know who you are, you can say back, well, it's okay, well, just stay here for a few minutes and you, you tell me about how you are, what age you are. Yeah. If somebody's, you know, being adaptive and coming from an adaptive child place, does that mean that they're not ready to do the inner child work? That maybe it's too soon that they haven't got the trust and the relationship's not there? Or is it just oh. a protective mechanism? Well, I think in psychotherapy there's never a black and white answer so when you said that i immediately thought well it depends where they are in the psychotherapy process so yes by definition you're correct it's very good to reflect about trust and is the relationship strong enough and what's going on between the two of you in the therapy process and does all that have to be built up before you know we can go back or they will allow themselves to go back to different places or the different parts of themselves. Yes, so there's all that at one level. It's a bit like a continuum. But, you know, sometimes people have to practice these things to be able to know they are safe enough to actually go back to that place um, with the therapist. As you were talking, that was what was going through my mind, that I can I can think of clients where we've dipped in and out of it. Yes, that's what I dip to toe in and come back and it's like, yeah, yeah that wasn't that bad and, and yeah. I feel safe and it's okay. Yeah. And yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. It's like a continuum. Yeah. I'll buy adaptation if we do a bit of bit at a time. Yes. And you allow me to come with you. Yes, yeah. And that, that's a lovely way of saying it. Yeah. Because we are with them. They're not on their own. Yeah. And this type of paper takes a long time. Mm. It's inner child work is never short term. That's when it's that's a good sign of adaptation, by the way. If you think you've done inner child work in four sessions or something, yeah, and you're vastly mistaken. You might have, you know, dipped your toe in, but if you think dipping your toe toe in is actually the totality of the work needed, then you need to think again. Yeah. And I, you know, I really believe that. Yeah. And again, you know, thinking about this client that I've had quite recently, it's, you know, he's had counselling before. And, you know, he said, I, I've never been, I've never discussed this stuff. It's never been spoken to me the way that you, you know, you phrase it or you put it, or I didn't even know that that was a thing or whatever. So it's not every counsellor or, or every psychotherapist or every modality that does this work. 
No, because they don't think developmentally. Yeah. Or Stoke and they were not trained to do the developmental work. Or they believe in different types of techniques, which keeps people in the adults. They're actually perhaps thinking, thinking about the past affects the present. Yeah. And that's okay, by the way. But Absolutely. if you're talking about in a child work, then you have to think developmentally. Yeah. There's no way about it. There's no way, two ways about it. If you looked on my phone here, you'd find there's 1,727 pictures. And uh, there's, I'm looking at one now where there's six pictures of me when I'm about four. Oh. <laughs> now, if you did do any child work, you might have said to somebody, oh, Bring some, bring four pictures of yourself in, and tell me about them as you look at them. That would be a beginning of in a yeah. child work. But you need to think developmentally, and you need to then go on and say, "Are we happy there? What's happening for you?" Yeah. Oh well, I remember that time. I had to be smiling because if I wasn't smiling, I wouldn't have dinner. Yeah. Now, just look in this picture here, you would never imagine that was a situation. Yeah. But the only way you get to the developmental issues, the unmet needs, the conflicts and everything else that goes forward is by asking them, what's happening there? Was it a good time for you? Tell me a little bit about what's behind the smile. And that's a really powerful thing to be saying rather than just taking it on face value and saying, oh, you look really happy there. Yes, that's the, that's not a thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a validate. It can be validating, but, you know, for a therapist to say that, I can, I can understand from some places, but, you know, for a client who has been so traumatised, has so much conflicts, and they hear somebody say that, the unfortunate part of that remark is they may have heard that somebody say that to them for all yeah. their lives. Yeah. They've never heard somebody say, you know what? What was really happening? Yeah. That's, I think, what we would call therapy. Yeah. Looking at how the past affects the present. I don't want to put down any therapist that says, oh, you look really happy there. But, but I would encourage the counsellor then to say, oh, you look really happy there. Was it really like that? Yeah. Because, you know, sometimes when you come in the room, you look very happy. But, you know, you're a person of a thousand smiles. Mm. See, to me, you... that's that goes right. That's like a bullseye, Bob. That That's like being seen and heard in one sentence. Yeah, that's, I believe, working with the inner child. Yeah. Now, if a therapist doesn't want to go there or doesn't want to work with developmentally, that's fine. They might do loads of other work yeah. with different parts of the self. But if we're talking about podcast on the inner child, then we need to go to the younger self, which perhaps hasn't had their attachment needs, their unmet needs met. And so today, under stress, may go to that part and their life is unhappy or depressed just as it was all those years ago no. the therapist or the therapist they've been to may never have connected the two yes yeah if you can do any child work you need to help them connect the two and you do need to move to go to integration you're right but only when the work has been done now how do you know when the work's been done you ask them again no as you work all this work you say yeah. you know uh, something like we've done a lot on this and we can go back there again or perhaps we could do some work at a, at a different development phase or i perhaps can't quite hear myself saying that but uh, you start to judge if you're attuned with the person in front of you whether some of those conflicts at the developmental level have been healed enough for them to allow themselves to grow up. Yeah. Psychologically. Yes. 
Yeah, and I, I I know we've done podcasts on this in the past, but I suppose the, the, there comes a point where it's about trusting your intuition as a psychotherapist and when you've got the experience to know, you know, because I'm not sure that our clients often know when the healing work's been done. One of the things I always say is, you know, with some clients, 99.9% .9 of the therapy, I think, takes place outside of the therapy room. It's as they're processing things after the session, you know, and yeah. I'm really chuffed to bits when my clients come back and say what's happened in the, the week in between when I've seen them. Mm. You know, like I kind of really got what you were saying in that last session. I understood it. That's wonderful in terms of continuity and catching up and reviewing and everything else. And you're a TA therapist, Jackie, so you believe in contracts, don't you? Absolutely, yeah. So Eric Byrne used to say he was the originator of TA. And did he ever work with any child? I'm not so sure because he didn't, he never really worked with a younger child, I think, the way we're talking about. But he often said in his books, oh, people, clients, um, know when they've healed themselves or didn't use that quite like that language when they've achieved their contract yeah now i'm not necessarily a fan of that by the way because i'm a fan of contracts by the way at the beginning of therapy talking about what you need what you don't need but i think as we start to do developmental work then contracts need to change and be reviewed and go with where the therapy is going to Absolutely. I was, as you were saying that, I was thinking, I don't want to say a lot of my clients because that's generalizing, but quite a few of them will say, I want to be happier. And that's that, you know, that's what they say in the first meeting. That's what they want. Yeah. But if you went further, I must, you must do this all the time, Jack, and said, I, I okay, do. So that's fine. Yeah. And what do you think happiness might mean for you? Does it mean being more content? Does it mean being in a relationship? Does it mean being uh, not feeling lonely? Does it mean, what does it mean? Yeah, I think one of the questions yeah. that I ask is, how will we know when you get there? <laughs> yeah, so you do contracts, don't you? Absolutely, yeah. So you, yeah. you go back and say, yeah. what if, you know, have, have we achieved this? Yeah, yeah. So contracts is a good barometer, I think, for therapists and clients to have that conversation as an indication of the healing we're talking about. Yeah. As a TA therapist, I like contracts. Yes, me too. For the reasons I'm talking here. How much do contracts come to in it, into inner child work? Well, maybe at the beginning, when we're talking about where we're going, maybe we're reviewing as we go along, maybe in terms of integration, but maybe in, in terms of work that's being done. They're, they are important barometers. Yeah. I think when I have done any inner child work, I've always... <laughs> felt a shift in the room like the, the the therapeutic relationship has gone down a, a deeper level somehow i'm not sure what that's about gone to a younger level yeah it's gone to a place where the disturbance actually began yeah no you don't go straight away down from you know 23 to 3 where the early but you may go down to the different developmental ages yeah start doing the work and the different development ages. And then, of course, what you'll feel is a different temperature in the room. The intensity will be different. And you'll start getting to where the real trauma occurred. Yeah. So, yes, there is a change in the therapy to work because you'll be working with somebody's younger, in brackets, inner child, so, so you know yourself, you worked in the world of fostering and adoption. When you work with the younger parts, the younger kids, it's more, there's a realness in the work. Yeah, yeah. And the intensity was different from the, an older age. Yeah. I think this is one of the reasons why I got into psychotherapy in the first place, because fostering made me feel quite hopeless a lot of the time. <laughs> You know, to me, it was kind of like we were always making allowances for the things that were missing in the upbringing. Whereas psychotherapy, to me, said that we can go back and fill in the gaps. 
it doesn't need to impact on them as adults or teenagers or whatever it is that there is hope we can reparent we can go back and mm. that's one of the things that i love about transactional analysis mm. Mm. we can help them take back parts of themselves yeah and take ownership of themselves yeah help them in connect different parts of themselves so they can be aware of all these different parts of themselves to then take their own true destiny and press yes. the line. Yeah. What a wonderful podcast, Bob. Yeah, I think it's really powerful. I think this work is very powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the one that we're going on to next leads on quite well from this one. It's making peace with your inner critic. That's the next one. That's the next podcast that we're going to be doing. They go together. That, that's what I that's, yes <coughs> in fact, I'm not even sure whether you can see the diagram behind me there's a picture of an impasse in there where it's going from the parent to the child or whatever which was a conversation I had with a client this week yeah wow we can't do the two yeah they go together so I look forward to talking about it absolutely until next time Bob thank you so much you're welcome take care take care you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review we'll be back next week with another episode